seats. God bless you. Praise God. Hallelujah. How many of you guys have wood stove fires? Anybody? Fireplace? Yeah, fireplace. Man, I used to growing up way out in the rainforest, Washington State. Perfect place to have a wood stove. It's wonderful, except wood stove didn't work too well. It was just a bunch of smoke that came out. But my grandma tried her best. But anyway, what happens when the fire goes low? What do you got to do? Stove them all Got to stir it up and put some more what on it? Wood. And so since Jesus came into our life, fire was placed inside of us. Jesus is the fire. Amen. But because of the world, the elements, the conditions of the world, it can, it can affect us. And so what do we need to, to, to stir up, to fan the flame? The Word. The Word works like wood to add fuel to the fire. Very good. You guys are getting it. <laughs> Maybe I'll preach her a little. I'll just let you guys see if you can say what needs to be said next. <laughs> Remember those uh, games when <laughs> we were kids, Mad Lib? You would have underline. We're going to play Mad Lib tonight. I'm just going to have underlines. You're just going to say. That would be cool if we ever got to that point, wouldn't it? We all brought the message together. Amen. I believe that day is coming. Maybe even tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we're going to learn about Isaiah. Life lessons from Isaiah. It's been a while since I taught on life lessons. It's been since like early October. Had a lot of different things going on on Wednesday nights. My wife did an excellent job last week. She's not here, but you can still give it up for my wife, Lorraine. Amen. On Esther. If you missed it, it is available on YouTube. You can find it on praisetabernacle.com, on our um, church link. Whatever you have, you can find a way to get the word. Amen. Um, so last time I taught was on Israel. So now we've moved ahead to Isaiah. Isaiah is an amazing prophet in the Bible. He was, um, his ministry of, as a prophet lasted about 64 years. About 64 years. He was married to a prophetess. So there was a prophet and prophetess team, him and his wife. Uh, I believe that's in chapter 8 where it actually talks about his wife and his two children. So he was married and had two children. And he basically went, he, uh, he was prophet through about four different kings' reign, including Hezekiah and Uzziah. They believe, he, they believe he's a cousin of Uzziah, um, who was a king. And um, so there was, there's not a lot of detail historically about Isaiah, except for those few details. But we're going to go into the Word to get some of deeper understanding and learn some life lessons from Isaiah. We're going to specifically target... Does anybody know where does that last song come from that we just sang? I asked Pastor Steve to actually sing that tonight. Why? Where does that come from? Isaiah. <laughs> Filled in the blank again. Good job. Isaiah chapter 6, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Amazing, um, beautiful picture of an encounter with God. How that changes your life. And... Um, I think we're going to take our time. I have 14 life lessons. It's just the first 25 chapters of, of Isaiah. There's actually, I believe, 63 chapters in Isaiah. And so we have a long ways to go. But if we don't get through all 14 tonight, that's okay. One thing that you guys can help me with is if something is hitting you, say something. Just say amen. Say something. Because we might dwell on that for a while, you know? Instead of rushing through it. I sometimes can rush to get through. But God wants us to take our time. Make sure that we allow his word to affect our lives. Amen. Amen. So there's no rush. If it takes us a year to go through Isaiah, so be it. So let's go through life lesson number one. Okay, first of all, as a prophet is different than the gift of prophecy. And so when we're now discussing the prophets. We're going to go from one prophet to the next prophet throughout the old covenant and prophets prophecy edifies it builds up it encourages so anybody that is not a prophet and prophesies 
there should never come out the word of correction. Only time the word of like correction or um, judgment comes forth is from prophets. And for one to be a prophet, you have to receive them as a prophet. So if a prophet is received as a prophet, then you've basically given them the right to bring correction in your life, to bring judgment when needed. Amen? Do we need correction sometimes? We all do. So we need the prophet. So prophets are made tough. Why? Because their messages are often hard messages. They're, they're, they're from God to deliver that are hard to bear. So the messages from God that that God wants to deliver that are hard for us to bear. Sometimes the word hurts. Amen? But we need it to hurt. I like to be challenged. It doesn't always feel good, but I like to, to feel challenged when I hear the word of God. I want to leave church challenged. I want to have something new to apply to my life, to bring change in my life. Because this is really why we come, right? We want to see change. Why do we come to God? Because we need a change. And why we continue to serve God? Because we continue to need to change. Because change is a process. Yes, we're brand new creatures in Christ Jesus. But it's a process to work that in us. That newness of life. So life lesson number two is with the message of judgment. See, Isaiah's messages, God was given them messages and they were messages of judgment. But with judgment comes hope. So when you, often we maybe have been in churches where we just feel judged. Or maybe the message came that way just full of judgment. There's nothing wrong with judgment as long as it brings hope. Because God doesn't want to just beat us down. Okay, he wants to raise us up. So sometimes it's needed to be, to get a little beat down. But if, you're, if we're a good parents and we correct our children the right way. We don't just yell and scream at them or spank them if you still believe in that. But we, um, we tell them what they did wrong and explain how, what they need to do right so that they can do better. So a message of ju judgment comes bring, with it comes hope for it's a warning. And if repentance follows mercy will be given. So, with all the doomsday stuff about America's coming to an end, don't believe all that. There's always mercy to be given. We're not wiped out, are we? So there's always opportunity for mercy. So let's believe God for the mercy. Let's believe God that America will last. America will continue. America will grow, grow strong again. Rem America will turn back to God fully as a nation. Amen? So I believe in and believing the best is to come, not the worst. Life lesson number three, and this is where we get into the word right here, Isaiah 6, 5 through 7. Isaiah 6, 5 through 7. And then, it's, then I said, it's all over. I am doomed. So Isaiah's encountering God being lifted up. He's encountering and seeing God face to face. See, Isaiah was a minister before that. But I believe after this encounter is when he became a prophet. I believe this is when things change dr drastically. We can minister, we can go to church, we can go through the motions, we can walk in our gift, but there's something different when we, when we encounter God. It's a heart change. Then I said, it's all over, I'm doomed, for I am a sinful man. I, am fil I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. See, the closer we get to God, actually sometimes the more convicted we become. The more we see the things that need to leave from our life. Things that need to go. Sometimes we feel even, sometimes, even, you know, I know great ministers that feel unworthy. We often feel that way because the closer we get to God, how great and worthy he is, the most, more unworthy we feel. But yet God reminds us, I have called you. I have chosen you. I have made you worthy because of what I have done. 
Yet I have seen the king, the Lord of heaven's armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal he had taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, See, this coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Amen. So life lesson is we can only go so far in encountering God if we hold on to guilt. How can we move forward if we're stuck in the past? Some of us tonight might be stuck in our past. We're wondering why things aren't changing in our lives. Why we're going through such misery all the time. Maybe it's God saying, there's still some past you haven't let go of. The moment we came to the Lord, we could totally let go of all of our past. But often we don't. And because some of us have such a past and have so many things to work out, God just takes it one thing at a time because He understands how much we can handle. But when God reveals things, we need to let it go. We need to move past guilt, unforgiveness. You now, as long as we struggle with joy, that's a sign that we still have guilt in our life. If we, have, if we struggle having joy, and often I found during seasons like this, Christmas, because it's such a family time, such a close time, and if we have poor, bad memories, or we have guilt due to our family and some of the choices we've made or some of the things that family members have done to us, this time of year is when it comes up to the surface. So we have a lot of guilt, and we have a lot of, and so we're not joyful. And so that's a sign that we know we have some work that God needs to do in our hearts is if we are lacking in joy. Because the Bible says that in His presence is what? The fullness of joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So we should be having joy, should be normal, natural characteristics of Christians. And if we don't have that joy, it's most likely some guilt that we still hold on to. And yet we don't have to. The moment we say, go, in Jesus' name, it's gone. Because God already removed it, but He won't force it out of our hand if we want to hold on to it. So it's, it's, it's I want to be free. Don't you want to be free of your past? Then let's simply be free of our past. And I say, oh, well, it's not that easy. It is that easy because of the blood. It is that easy because of the blood. It's a choice that we choose. And I don't want to, to be held back from what God has for me because of somebody else. That person's not worth it. No matter how important they once were in my life, no matter how close they are to me, no matter how, you know, how a family member, a mother, a father, a son, a daughter, whoever it was, they're not worth what God has for me to hold me back because of the guilt for what I've done to them or what they've done to me. It's just not worth it. Because God has given us life and life more abundantly. He wants us to enjoy the bountiful blessings even in this life. Not just in the life to come, but in this life we can enjoy the, the, the goodness of God. The fullness of His blessings. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. The love of God poured out upon us. These things are all available. Even the prosperity of God. He will prosper us in all things. So let's let go of that guilt. Let's make sure that we can enjoy this season, but not just this season. It shouldn't be just Christmas every year that we, some of us, this is the, the time of the year that we have joy. It shouldn't just be because Christmas that we have joy. It should be because of God we have joy, and because God is with us each and every day. It's always Christmas season, always the season of Christ, because Christ is was born, and Christ died, and Christ continues to live in us. So therefore, let it not just be some seasonal great feeling that we get, 
because we got the trees up and the lights on and, uh, and we have good memories and we get together with our family. No, it's a lifestyle of being joyful all the time. I'm actually reading a devotion, um, a, like 30 day or 21 day or something devotion on my Bible app for joy for this time of year. Joy through understanding the story of Christmas. Hallelujah. So I encourage you, do it tonight. Don't leave this place holding on to any guilt. If there's anything in your mind right now that you've held on to, let it go. If you need prayer, get prayer tonight. But don't leave this place sad, depressed, down. Jesus died on that. Imagine what Jesus did on that cross. He died so that we don't have to walk in that anymore. He took it away. Maybe other people might not forgive us for what we've done, but He has, and that's all that matters. Often it can be our children that don't forgive us. Now that's hard to bear. But they have to answer to God. And the best thing we can do for our children, for everyone around us, is move on. To be filled with God's joy. To be something that they might change. They might see God in us over time. And that is what will change them. Amen? Hallelujah. So let's look at life lesson number four because it really goes along. It's also in Isaiah chapter 6. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall, should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am. Send me. And he said, Yes, go and say to this people, Listen carefully, but do not understand. Watch closely, but learn nothing. So three of the main requirements in being a minister of the Lord, a sent one, is first of all, a right heart, an ear to hear, and a courage to speak. We're all ministers of God if we have those things in place. A right heart, an ear to hear, and a courage to speak His Word. God wants to send out His messengers. He wants people to speak His Word. His Word is the most powerful tool in the universe. His Word is what changes hearts and changes lives, changes the world. So God cannot give the message to the whole world through just a preacher on the pulpit. Every one of us that are, that are Christians are His messengers. And there's people out about, about all around you that God wants to speak His Word through. The key is, like we saw with Isaiah, that encounter with God. When you fall in love with God, when you have that kind of love encounter with God, when it's no longer just dating God or checking God out, but it's really marriage to God, and now you're intimate with God, and you're encountering God on a regular basis, then His love gives you boldness. His love, you become so in love. How many of us remember the day when we first fell in love with whoever we're with right now? I know when I first fell in love with my wife, saw her, she was the one that I always dreamed, and many of you have probably heard this story before, but especially the young youth that I spoke this message to many, many times over the years. But anyway, tell us, tell you again, there's nothing better than a good old love story, right? So I, since I was a child, I had this vision of whom I would marry. And then when I saw her, exactly whom I had seen, even though she was 3,000 miles away from where I grew up, God supernaturally brought us together. And when I saw her, I knew right away she was the one. And then God spoke to her audibly, which I've never heard this, but she did. Your husband has arrived. So we just knew it right away. And so we were, I had to go back to my home in Washington. She had to go back to her home in St. Lucia because we met on St. Croix. And um, we had, within just one week, she, I asked her, she, I asked her to go out with me. And she said she doesn't date. I said, uh-oh, then who are you, you know, what? She wants to find the right one. I said, well, then marry me. And she said, yes. I want to get married right away, but we were, 
directed by older, wiser people to wait. So we came back together, but while we were away from each other, I remember I was waiting tables, and every single person I waited tables on, I told them the story. I couldn't keep my mouth shut. People came to dinner to eat, and they're hearing a love story. Of course, most people liked it, and I got great, great tips. I had plenty of money to buy the ring, to go back to the islands, to, to live for quite a while before I ran out of money, but got a nice Miami Vice type suit that I wore. So I was, I was working it. So the point is, we need to have that kind of encounter with God. When we have that kind of encounter with God, it's easy to tell other people about the love you have with God. That's all it is. If you're that much in love with somebody, it spills over. It's not that difficult. You don't have to say, you don't have to think about everything you have to say. It just comes out. And when it comes out from love, it affects people. It touches them. You might not be able to quote scriptures, but it touches lives because it comes from love. It comes from your love experience with the one who is love. And now you're just simply sharing that love with everyone around you. But again, like Isaiah, we need that special touch. He felt like his mouth was dirty. What's the one thing we struggle with the most? Most. Our tongue, our words. You sometimes can't believe the stuff that comes out of your mouth. I can't. My wife and I have so often, being honest and transparent, so often we have said, my goodness, how many times can we just say, Lord, let me not talk about nobody, but pray about everybody. It's a thing that I've always quoted so much, but I continue to fall short in because of that tongue. The only way we can tame the tongue, as it says in James, is it can't be controlled except through the Holy Spirit. And so we need the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit over and over and over and over again. We can't think that we can make it a day without being filled with the Holy Spirit. Even moment, it has to be the first thing we do each morning is get filled with the Holy Spirit. Because I know being married that it just takes one word to wreck the day. Just one word. And knowing the way the world is because they've been taught that way by news to look for the negative. To pinpoint the wrong. So if we give people an inch, they'll take a mile. So by one word, we can cancel all the witness we were. People still have to answer to God. They can't use us as an excuse. But we shouldn't give them an excuse. So we got to understand our words have power for good or for evil. And just because we're Christians doesn't mean we say the right thing because our heart is not yet pure. In Christ it is, though. And we have to choose to be. It's a choice every day. Just like we had to choose to receive salvation in Christ, we have to choose to walk in Christ every single day. And only through walking in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit can our tongue be controlled. Because that's probably our biggest witness, is our tongue. We can go pray for somebody and see healing take place. And they say, wow, man, God is real. Then, then we can talk like an idiot. And they say, well, I really don't want that, God. You know, so we got to be very careful when it comes to our tongue. And we got to be like Isaiah every single day. Lord, touch my tongue. Cleanse me from unrighteousness. Purify my heart. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Amen? All right. I knew we were going to talk about that one for a while. But we'll try to move on to life lesson number five. Unless you guys have anything else to add to that. Any words to the blank? Okay. Life lesson number five. So how far our ministry develops? Because again, we're all called to ministry. My job, Pastor C's job, is to equip you. Our ministry is the ministry of equipping. Your ministry, 
unless you're in the fivefold office of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher, your ministry is the ministry of works. Okay, there's two ministries the ministry of equipping and the ministry of works. Okay, my ministry, I was sent to the church. Your ministry as the church is you're sent to the world. And so your ministry is works. What does that mean? The works of Christ manifested from your life. The things that Jesus did, we all do are all doing now. And even greater works. So it's 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 so how far will our ministry develop? How far will it go? Well it depends on how obedient we are to deliver the messages God gives us. How willing are we to say? Because his messages, again, sometimes bring conviction and sometimes are not that easy for people to hear. To just simply speak the word of God. To speak the Bible. To quote the scriptures. To whatever, share whatever the Lord lays on our heart. Sometimes we have to go out and pull people out of the fire, it says. So there's a time that we, will we deliver the message when God gives it to us? When God gives us that unction to function, will we step out? When he says to go talk to that person over there, will we actually do that? How far will our ministry develop? It's not about how far we can get to get up here. Maybe if I become a deacon, next I'll become an elder. Then after being an elder, I'll become a pastor. And after a pastor, I'll become a bishop. And it's like trying to work your way up. It's not about that at all. Ministry, the main ministry of the Lord is in the fields. And that is in the world. And so how our ministry develops, we don't need to worry about trying to get a platform. If that's where God's called us, then we're called into an office. But our main platform as saints, as Christians, is in the world. It's in your job. It's in your environment. You don't have to look far for ministry. Ministry is wherever there is a people, a person. And guess what? There's people everywhere. I don't think we live up in the mountains in Alaska where there's not many people around. You know, one time I went on a mission trip to Guyana. And for us to get to the people, we had a canoe. We had to take a canoe to each house. It took a distance. You couldn't just walk to them. It actually took an effort to go give them the message. That was right after the movie Anaconda came out. And it was in Guyana where the anacondas are. And I saw one. It was kind of scary. And I swam in the dark black waters and saw a snake coming at me and jumped out of the water and but it was the only way to bathe, and man, when you haven't bathed for a couple of days, you're willing to do anything. At least I was. But anyway, how far our ministry develops? So we're looking for ministry to develop. We're looking for the pastor to recognize us. We're looking for, for people to recognize us. When God is just saying, step out and reach the people that are around you. And if you reach the people around you, guess what? They will reach people that are around them. And then you begin to multiply and expand your ministry and expand the Lord working through you and touching lives all over the place. Amen? So it touches, it starts with Isaiah himself needed the touch from God. Then when he was touched from God, what did he want? He said, now Lord, send me. I want to be your instrument. I want to be used by you. It's just like, when, you know, that's marriage, what it's all about. It's about partnership. I don't want to work for you and sometimes that's how we treat our wives as men. But God called us, just like in a relationship with Him, with our spouse, to partner together. Because why? Because we long to be with each other. Where is God? Well, God is not just hanging out in church. God is everywhere. <laughs> and especially where the wounded are, the hurting, the down and out. Where did Jesus go? Jesus was in the bars. Jesus was in the, in, the, in the darkest of dark places. And that's where Jesus is now. But He needs us to be there to be His mouth so that He can speak. And He needs us to be His hands so that He can touch. But we have to say, Lord, here I am. Send me. And when we have that heart, then He will empower us. 
And we don't even know, a lot of us have no clue what power is in us. Why? Because we haven't stepped out yet. I remember when I was preaching in the, in the islands with Youth in the Mission, and they said, it's just, they said it's just go out and minister. And I went by myself into a bar, and I just preached the gospel. Why? I did it, so God gave me the words. Did I know what I was say, going to say? No. I just stepped out. You know, there's times when people just come, and I just pray for them, and then fire would come out of my hands, and people would be healed. Did I know I had that power? No. But because I stepped out and put myself in a position where God could use me, God showed up. So we're lacking encountering God. We're looking for something in church all the time when God's saying, I'm looking to you to go out. And when you step out, you will encounter me because I will be in the midst. I have felt God's presence the strongest while ministering people, over people, praying over people. Sometimes I've seen that before, people praying over people and they themselves get affected by it and almost fall over whatever. Just the presence of God is so great. So I encourage you, if you want to experience more of God, yes, God wants us to seek Him personally, individually, on our own intimacy, but He wants us to go out and minister to other people and we'll encounter Him right there. So I believe we all need to have that heart going into 2015. God, where are you sending me? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to reach? And again, it's not that hard to figure out. God set you up wherever you're at. He put you where you are. Maybe he will send you beyond that at some point. But right now, just minister to those who are in your circle of influence. Most of you have family. Most of you have friends. Most of you have employees. Employers. You work for people. There's people all around us. None of us to stay at home all the time by ourselves. We all have to go to the post office. We all have to go to the mall. We all have to go to the grocery store. We have to go places. So why don't we just go to those places with God, being sensitive to His Holy Spirit, and just simply listen and follow the nudge when He gives it. Amen? Amen. So we got through life lesson number five. Maybe we'll get through life lesson number six. Let's see. This goes along with ministry as well. Life lesson number six. Then the Lord said to me, make a large signboard and clearly write this name on it. Somebody, this is, the, this is your opportunity. Blank. Somebody say it. Why hasn't nobody named their child that? There's so many biblical names. Nobody's named their child that one. Definitely sounds like a Muslim name, but anyway. I asked Uriah the priest and Zechariah, son of Jeberechiah, both known as honest men, to witness my doing this. So the life lesson is, it is wise to surround yourself with honest people who can be a witness against those who may try to slander you. So trust me, if we decide to step out, God does step in, but the enemy comes against us. And he will use people and even other Christians who are not yet mature, who are being matured, but in our immaturity we can act like children and we can be caught up in fleshly thinking and therefore we can turn against our own brothers and sisters in the Lord. And the world will turn against us because we're stepping out. We're meaning business. We're doing damage to the enemy. We're enforcing the kingdom of God and his rule on earth. And so the enemy does not like that. So he'll use whoever he can to try to destroy us. So that's why it's very important. That's why it's important when you do go out to witness, to go out with somebody, somebody who can back up. That's why you don't, as a male, you don't witness to a female alone somewhere. You know, there's certain things we have to put around a certain wisdom we got to use so we don't get ourselves in trouble when we go out and minister to other people. So it's just using wisdom. Amen? I think we'll try one more. We'll get through seven. So we have 14. We'll get through the next half next week, and then we'll follow in 2015 the rest of Isaiah. 
because then we're going to have a special Christmas Eve service on the 24th. And then we're going to have a New Year's Eve service, a prophetic service on the 31st. So it just happens it's the 31st on a Wednesday. So we might as well make it a prophetic service. We would have anyway. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then going into 2015, um, the South Jersey Revival Alliance and the pastors I've been meeting with, we decided um, that we're going to have a 21-day fast and encourage our churches to follow along with that, however the Lord would lead you. And so that will begin on the 4th, the first Sunday in January, and go 21 days. There's going to be two Wednesdays that we actually join up with other churches and have the service together. We will also have service here, but it will just be open worship. But if you want to go along with me, I'll be going to Pastor Young's church in Atlantic City on the 7th of January. And then the 14th will be Pastor Garth's church, Spirit and Truth, in Egg Harbor City. So more information will be given, but that was just a quick commercial. Life lesson number seven. That's why they give in commercials, because our attention span is very limited. Life lesson number seven, the, the last one for the night. The Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does. He said, don't call everything a conspiracy like they do. And don't live in dread of what frightens them. So the life lesson is, a lot of us like to talk about conspiracies, don't we? I do myself sometimes about, man, the nine, I, I think President Bush was responsible for those twin towers going down. That's out there. <laughs> it's pretty good evidence on that one. <laughs> and all kinds of stuff that are out there if you YouTube everything. But anyway, the life lesson is God is who we should listen to above all others. So before we get into all this stuff, of, yeah, you know, and, and the, the Illuminati and, the, and, the, and the, the masonry, and I know, you know, and this and that, and the, the sign that all the Hollywood actors put means all that has some validity maybe, but the main thing is, are, what are we hearing from God? And when we see these kind of things, let's ask God about it and see what He says. Some of that stuff God just says, you know what, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Let people do what they want. Just continue to follow me. Amen? Because in the end, who wins? And guess what? We already did win. <laughs> so let's just enjoy our victory and stop getting caught up by worrying about what those who are not going to be victorious are doing. Yeah, pray for them and believe that they will get on the, the right side. So the life lesson again is God is who we should listen to above all others. It will mean going against what is popular sometimes. And therefore will make enemies. One thing that's been popular lately is a lot of people love to knock um, Joel Osteen. A lot of critical stuff about Joel. How about we don't get caught up in that unless we just pray. We just ask God, do you think God wants us to be talking about that? Do you think we really know what's really going on? I'm around pastors. We talk about that kind of stuff. But we should just keep our mouth shut. But who shall we fear? Okay. It will mean going against what is popular and therefore will make enemies. But who shall we fear? Man who can kill us or God who has the keys to eternity? So we should fear God and fear God alone and not be caught up in all this he say, she say, this say, this is going to happen, all this stuff. Let's get caught up in God. Okay, when's the world going to end? Let's get ready for that. Prepare. Okay, whatever. Okay, God, give us all wisdom. Natural disasters could come anytime. Terrorists, yes, could happen. All that could happen. We should be prepared. But let's follow the king. Let's listen to him. He will tell us if we're listening, and he'll forewarn us when something's about to go down, if it's going to go down. He will prepare our hearts. He will tell us. How about we just ask him, Lord, is there anything I need to be concerned about? Is there anything I need to prepare about? Instead of just getting it from the news and getting it from everybody else and getting it from YouTube talks and whatnot, let's just get it from God. We have ears, and God's given us those ears to do what? To hear. And that's all we got to do is ask and listen he will respond. Amen. He will speak to our hearts. 
And if we know the Word of God, it'll be made clear. If we don't know the Word of God, we need to know the Word of God so we can become clearer. Okay? Because sometimes we can't hear God that clearly because we don't know His Word. We don't know His will. But the more we know it, the more we'll understand it, and the more when we talk to Him, the more we'll be able to hear Him when He speaks. Amen? I think we hit enough, so let's pray. So I asked the Lord what I believe he wanted to do tonight as we continue in worship. And if you need any kind of ministry, what would the Lord like to do tonight? And so that that main area that I was targeting, the Lord was targeting, was guilt. So if any of us tonight have any guilt that needs to be removed, again, God, Jesus has already removed it. But sometimes we just need somebody to pray with us in agreement to see that thing go to see that cleansing come and to see us be renewed. Amen? Maybe some of us might have trouble with our tongue tonight. And if that's you, just come and ask for prayer. And what would we pray for? More Holy Spirit. Because that's the only way we can control our tongue. Some of us are being called, we're feeling a call to be sent out. You just need some clarity and some confirmation if that's you tonight. Please come forward for prayer. But whatever your prayer need is, be here to pray as we continue to worship for about 15 more minutes so father we just thank you for your word tonight we thank you lord god for working in our hearts and changing our lives we just yield to you O lord have your way in us O god as we come before you to continue to worship you lord whatever needs to be worked in us completely tonight lord have your way we surrender to you in jesus name amen